You are listening to Living Art. I'm Michael Woodson. This is KPFT 90.1 FM Houston HD1 and HD2 KPFT.org streamed and archived. And thank you very much for uh, listening to the show, t- uh, tuning in uh, to Living Art. It's a great, great, great uh, guest tonight. I think you're going to really uh, be amazed and um, floored by how we're going to talk about Marx and journalism. Did you know that Marx was a journalist? So tonight, my guest is Spencer Leonard, and uh, he teaches history at the University of Virginia, and he's the guest tonight. Uh, Michael Carson, by the way, is is out still on vacation, a well-deserved vacation. And um, uh, But back to the matter at hand, it's uh, Spencer Leonard, who teaches history at the University of Virginia. He's a, a founding member of uh, the Platypus Affiliated Society, and he's got lots and lots of articles and videos out there and he's kind of an amazing person. He's kind of mild-mannered on the surface and ferocious and daring at the same time. So great combination there. There's a lot to say about him. But um, you, um, what we're going to talk about tonight is his forthcoming books. Um, the two titles we have, Marx and Engels on Bonapartism, Selected Journalism, 1851-59. to said tonight to me that he just that just now hit the press so you can pre-order it maybe and the the other one Marx and Engels on imperialism selected journalism 1856 to 62 so welcome to living arts Spencer Leonard well thanks for having me it's great Um, great. let, let me just start off by correcting you I no longer teach at the University of Virginia I'm now teaching sociology at James Madison University in Virginia. So okay, it doesn't really matter. Yes, James Madison. Okay, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you got into history. Oh my goodness, how I got into history itself, I can't even remember. I I know that my father was. A great lover of history, especially of, of of American Revolutionary and Civil War history. Um, I'm actually at home for Christmas now. Uh, my father's no longer uh, alive, but of course, one thinks of one's family, especially at Christmas time. Uh, he took us um, to Gettysburg. My brother and I. Uh, as early as elementary school, I remember winning a Daughters of the American Revolution uh, History Prize. I was always interested in it, but I never really thought about, you know, it was something that you studied except just to get through school, um, you know, until I went to college. And I, I actually ended up getting uh, super interested in the history of, of Asia. Um, and... Of, of what we call South Asia in particular, the, the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and that's what I do professionally. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that, the connection to, 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 to these books and to this topic is that uh, there are writings, there, there are pieces of, of Marxist journalism on India that are some of the most famous of his journalism of the 1850s. Uh, they're even widely anthologized. Um, any of your listeners who are you know, moderately familiar with the writings of Karl Marx may have read um, The British Rule in India and The Future Results of the British Rule in India. Those are probably uh, the two most famous pieces of, of Marxist journalism as a whole. Uh, so, for instance, those are included in uh, a very widely taught anthology uh, by uh, Robert Tucker, the Marx Engels reader, 
uh, and they're the only works of Marxist journalism from the 50s that are included there, uh, they're super important in India. Um, there would really be no Indian leftist uh, who wouldn't be familiar uh, with not only those two pieces, but all of the work that, that Marx wrote about India. And so that was my introduction. Um, you know, so it, out of my interest in, in, in South Asian history, uh, you know, sort of the origins of which would be too long to tell. Um, and my interest in the left, you know, there came, you know, there were these very important writings that were important for the Indian left and, and fascinating to me as, especially as I grew, um, more and more interested in, in, in Marx in, in the 1990s. Okay, so um, I guess I'm trying to think of our audience and sort of giving them a frame right. for this. Um, and next week, I, I want to pick this up a little more deeply, talking about the different forms that he writes in. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Just where do you start, right? I guess, like, Marx, the journalist, really? I, I guess people know that Marx is a political economist or they see him as a philosopher uh, maybe even uh, a propagandist with the Communist Manifesto, and suddenly you realize this guy's writing journalism too, and he, I guess we'll just go with that, right? If people understand that um, he writes a, a, a wide variety of, of uh, genres. You picked up on journalism, but it's no small thing. Like in, in the 50s, that was his main gig. So talk about the scope of his journalism, I guess. Sure. I mean, I, I would say, you know, that when, I mean, really, uh, it's, it's totally commonplace for, you know, revolutionaries from you know, even the American Revolution, um, even the English Revolution, um, you know, in the 17th century through the 19th century, you know, in some sense to be journalists but we think of them as, as you know we think of that as, as revolutionary um, writing you know so you know there were a great deal of pamphlets published and uh, you know fly sheets and the like in in the English Civil War there was an explosion of, 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 of publishing there, there, there always is uh, in you know a revolutionary situation a, a ramping up of a public debate and in the American Revolution, we would think of something like the American Crisis, you know, by Tom Paine. Um, you know, these are the t these are the, the you know, these are the times that tried men's souls, right? Uh, the famous line uh, from the American Crisis. But you know, there was a whole series that Thomas Paine was publishing uh, at the time, and you could think of someone like John Paul Marat. You know the the great uh, French revolutionary uh, newspaper editor and journalist, and so in all of those cases, you you had you know revolutionaries who would edit and write uh, for the press, and 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 actually Marx is like that too. Um, you know, his very early on after he got his PhD. Uh, he edited a, uh, and he was still a very young man. Um, it's really it was really like a law degree that he had. Um, he he edited a newspaper called the Rheinische Zeitung, the you could say like the Rhineland News or the Rhenish News, um, in the city of Cologne in 1842-43, which was very liberal. But he was the editor, and you know, he wrote uh, a great deal of the content, as as was the, the fashion or the the, the practice. And um, in the Revolution of eighteen forty eight, uh, he revived that paper, you know, as as the new uh, Rhineland News, the Neue Rheinische Zeitung. Um, and that paper was shut down as the revolution um, collapsed 
in in Germany in, in 1849. Um, so what we call Marxist journalism, or what I'm calling Marxist journalism in these books, is really Marx writing as a professional journalist, and you know, as opposed to like a crusading journalist, or um, perhaps more particularly as a political journalist who have total editorial control because they control the paper or the paper is dedicated uh, to a political line that they're fundamentally involved in forging. Marx is not doing that in the 1850s. He's no in no position to do that in the 1850s. He's writing for newspapers, uh, you know, that are, of course, friendly, broadly speaking, uh, to his revolutionary perspective, um, but they are not under his control. And so the most important of those, his big gig, if you were, if you will, uh, for the decade roughly from 1852 to 1861, is the New York Tribune. Um, obviously a, an English language newspaper out of New York. Um, it had a weekly edition that was sent all around the country, uh, was circulated around the country in Republican circles. It was a radical Republican newspaper um, edited by um, a man who ended up running for president uh, against Ulysses S. Grant in 72 uh, and sort of minor figure in American history, Horace Greeley. Uh, so Marx wrote for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune uh, and, and sporadically uh, for some German language papers, but, you know, the, the continent of Europe, it was much harder for him to publish. You know, there was a great deal more freedom in the United States, at least in the North, and um, than there was anywhere um outside of England. Um, he also wrote uh, for the working class or chartist press in, in England. Um, so that's what we're talking about. You know, it's really the, um, you could say, the second major phase of, of Marx's life. Uh, if we think of Marx's life as, as you know, as as an intellectual, not talking about his biography, but talking about him as a historical figure, um, you know, there's really the period of his 20s in the 1840s culminating, you know, his work is culminating in the writing of the, of the Communist Manifesto in 1848, and then his revolutionary activity um, in the Revolution of 1848, of course, there were a lot of great and important works, uh, many of them, um, you know, extremely um, valuable still that he wrote in the 1840s, very sort of philosophical uh, in his engagements at that time. He was kind of engaged with breaking with criticizing uh, the young Hegelians and arriving at a revolutionary, a proletarian socialist perspective which we know, to, you know, which is embodied in the Communist Manifesto. And then there's the period of really counter-revolution after the, after the collapse and the descent into um, imperialism uh, in, uh, you know, of, of the revolution of 1848. And that period of counter-revolution, uh, you know, basically continues... Uh, uh, throughout the 1850s, and and then uh, you you know I would say, based you know in broad outlines, the the situation begins to change uh, with the outbreak of the American Civil War, um, and especially with the radicalization of the American Civil War uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation, and from that point onwards. Um, Marx ceases to write journalism, so these books end with uh, Marx's writings on the American Civil War, and you get the period of, of the first international in the 1860s, 
um, and then there would be a, a kind of a final phase of, of Marx's life, uh, you know, in the in you know after the collapse of the first international. Um, are, so this is this is in really the second of the four major phases of Marx's uh, you know thought and revolutionary activity, and it's in a period of political you know as I say counter revolution. You are listening to Living Art on. Uh, KPFT 90.1 FM, Houston HD1. I'm talking to Spencer Leonard. I'm Michael Woodson. And just a little um, uh, footnote, and then I want to take you to talk about the 1848 moment. But what you're, what reading the introductions to your uh, two volumes really brought to me was like the uh, large number of articles that he wrote and you know he, he's written so much that I don't think that our listeners that the general public really appreciate just like the volume of what he's doing because you heard of the Communist Manifesto and Capital but he's got other books that probably aren't as well known to the general public like the Civil War in France or the 18th Brumaire uh, he's got, uh, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of, of newspaper articles. Yes. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of interesting. And then you have Capital and you know, these other, other works. Anyway, it just kind of makes you laugh to realize just, you know, like what kind of mind right. so one, he has. One way to kind of, one way to frame it is, you know, just, is to think about, like, you know, to, to put things in, in, in very straightforward terms, Michael, is that, you know, most people think of Marx as, as sort of three things and then sort of loosely related. Um, and and it's, it's linked to the, you know, the kind of common saw, you know, that you hear, like Marx is a synthesis of British political economy, of, 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 of French socialism, uh, or, or French revolutionary traditions and of um, German philosophy, right? And, you know, still you get people who, who think about him in that way, but, um, you know, in other words, they're preoccupied with capital. And they think of him as like an economist, or they might think of him as like a sociologist or a social theorist. Right. Uh, or they, they think of him as like the author of, the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, the German ideology, um, you know, works of, of that nature, and they think of him as a philosopher. Um, you know, what you know, they they do think of him as a as, as a revolutionary, but they tend to think of that as as it were biographical. Um, you know, and so one way you'll hear this is that people will sometimes say, well, Marx never wrote a theory of the state. Um, and I think that is very misleading, and it kind of gets into your question, which is really that you know, Marx prosecutes politics and he thinks about politics kind of in and through events themselves. And, and in that sense, um, you get this pile of of journalistic writings, you know, that are about events, uh, and they're difficult for students today because those events themselves are sometimes obscure, or, in a sense, a lot of, in a, to a large degree, uh, the events are only known because they were occasions for major works by Karl Marx, um, you know, so. Most people think about the event that we know as the Paris Commune, you know, to the extent that they know about it, uh, because Karl Marx wrote about it, right? Which is very, very misleading, um, you know, because no comrades of Marx were particularly involved in those events in Paris um, in, in 1871. Um, so. The, the journalism that I have edited flows really directly out of the 
newspaper writings, which are, I think, sadly neglected. I think, in general, Marx is a political and revolutionary thinker, and as a critic of, you know, as a kind of a dialectician of, of, of politics and of history itself, um, you know, that this is really neglected. Um, and in part, Marxists themselves are to blame for this. Um, but the writings that, you know, that, that would be important to really know, you know, in, if you're interested in Marxist politics, would be his writings from 1848, um, which almost nobody reads. Um, and the, the, the extreme, you know, the much more famous kind of digests of that experience that he wrote in exile immediately after the events of the Revolution of 1848. And those are the class struggles in France and most famously the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. And those are sort of deep studies of history, particularly French revolutionary history, uh, and France was the epicenter of the Revolution of 1848, um, and the most, in a sense, poignant case in 1848. Um, yeah, let's talk that about are written very cl- very close to the event themselves. Let's talk about uh, like how neglected 1848 is, and um, I'll let you articulate it. Um, but everybody uh-huh. knows about like 1789, I think, and everybody knows about 1917, right? The French Revolution, the um, the Russian Revolution, like those are huge, right, for the left. But like 1848, it seems to me, gets neglected, and then not only neglected, like if it is attended to, people aren't picking up on the importance of the shift from um, a generic kind of like ending of the bourgeois revolution and the beginning of uh, of uh, Bonapartism, which is what your book is, you know, centered on. Right. So, you know, what you get, in, you know, from people on on the left, I mean, it's... I, I'm not... The way mainstream history talks about these things, I think, is, is increasingly obscure. But uh, the old language for talking about these things is, you know, bourgeois revolution on the one hand, and the meaning of that term is uh, quite fraught, actually, mm-hmm. uh, what it really what it really means, but, but, you know, just for your listeners to kind of guide them if they're, if they're uh, interested in these methods, what it really means is, is, is revolutionary, is, is revolution guided by and propelled by and also resulting in um, enlightenment, the, the enlightenment project of the self-emancipation of the society of labor, um, the, the self-emancipation of the society of the third state, um, as it was put by the French Revolution in 1789. And so there's sort of this idea that you have those types of revolutions, and then you have you know, and, and the rotten leftist version of those, by the way, is the idea that those revolutions were somehow actuated or impelled by property owners, uh, by the bourgeoisie, and that's a misleading way, and just frankly a false way of thinking about it, um, because those revolutions were, were emancipations of slaves, emancipations of serfs. Um, you know, they, they were... Uh, for the emancipation of the whole of society um, from feudal bonds, arbitrary power, etc. And then they're contrasted with so-called socialist or proletarian revolutions. And the relationship between these two things is less obscure. Um, and the, the sort of implication is, is that one is a revolution on behalf of property owners and the other is are revolutions on behalf of the property less, and this is um, this doesn't really help you to understand the course of history very well. 
uh, or to understand the potential relevance of, of these ideas, uh, you know, to uh, the present. Um, because really, uh, the bourgeois revolution keeps going. Um, you know, it, it, it continues to be uh, an ongoing project, uh, you know, right straight through the present. Uh, and, and socialism sort of emerges within that as um, as a social question, as the question of the working class, of the of, of the uh, crisis of that revolution that's sort of expressed by um, the opposition of potential opposition of of. Uh, of classes that had been united uh, in bourgeois revolution, uh, but really it's more fundamentally a matter of the emergence of democracy as sort of a fundamental political problem. Um, and, and so the rise of socialism and the emergence of, of mass democracy are really closely tied in a way that um, you know, isn't, I think, properly appreciated in general. Um, you know, it's been pushed for by socialists. Socialists are pushing for democracy, and democracy is also posing a problem for socialists um, because the question becomes how does the working class act you know, or assume the leadership of or achieve the leadership of a you know, much wider democratic discontent in society. Um, and so that's really what the 1848 revolution is about. It's the first revolution in which the social question and um, Tied to that, uh, the question of universal suffrage democracy um, is posed and posed in a way that is sort of plainly fraught. And what I mean by that is, in the past, there had been a democratic dynamic uh, in revolution. Certainly, for instance, the Jacobins in the French Revolution, the most radical phase of the French Revolution, uh, there had been an expansion of the suffrage um, in that revolution, but in the eighteen, but you know, when we think about that, um, it's really the attack on the, the attack on suffrage or the curtailment of suffrage you know, is the form that counter revolution took. Whereas in eighteen forty eight counter-revolution takes a democratic form. Um, so this is really the, you know, the, the onus of, of the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, of Marx's famous writing on uh, Louis Bonaparte's overthrow of the French Republic that had been established in 1848, and, and it, you know, after one year, is uh, crowning himself you know, the uh, emperor of France founding the Second Empire, uh, imitating his uncle, Napoleon Bonaparte. And he does those things. He overthrows the French Republic and establishes the empire in the name of vindicating the right of universal suffrage of the people. And that's what makes... Uh, the the revolution of 1848 uh, so modern and I think um, so traumatic. I mean, if I were to really say, why do people not study it or not think about it or not know about it? Uh, it's because of how traumatic it is. Um, you know, it, it, it's just simply very revealing about uh, democracy and capitalism. Uh, it, it is um, Marx's revolution, and it poses the kinds of questions that you know Marx and Marxists want to raise. Um, so, 
I think that that's, you know, one way to sort of begin answering your question, Michael. Mm. You're listening to Living Art on uh, KPFT 90.1 FM Houston. I'm Michael Woods, and our guest here on Living Art tonight is Spencer Leonard, an historian with a a couple of books coming out soon on Marx and journalism. Now, uh, trying to dodge the arcane uh, uh, particular details of the journalism, uh, what can you see in uh, the journalism of the 50s that you include in your books that speak to the struggle of, um, uh, or the problematic, I guess, of democracy? I mean, it's just, it's just all over those writings. I mean, he has many, many subjects, and so it is impossible to go into the details because, you know, as I mentioned in the book, you know, Marx wrote, um, you know, nearly, he had published, uh, I, I think, nearly 500 articles in the New York Tribune alone, and he probably wrote considerably considerably more than that you know, we we don't have um, we, we've lost all of the articles that his editors refuse to publish um, you know we don't have any drafts of those um, he wrote one clean copy sent it to New York and if his editors rejected it uh, it seems that they didn't return the copy and and so they're, they're just lost. Um, you know, but he also wrote for um, other newspapers a great deal, especially uh, one called the Neue Oder Zeitung uh, in 1855. Um, wrote over 100 pieces for that. Um, so there's a lot of this material. What is, it, what is the subject matter of it? The subject matter is the events of the day. Um, and, of course, that can make it forbidding. Um, you know, for a contemporary reader, just like, uh, as I was describing, you know, a lot of people learn the history of 1848 by trying to understand Marx's writings on it. Um, you know, ultimately, I would recommend that they try to learn about the Revolution of 1848 a little bit, you know, just independently from historians. Um, but, you know, ultimately, Marx's writings are immensely uh, influential on all historians, uh, and, you know, so that, for instance, one of the greatest American historians of the Revolution of 1848, uh, a man named Jonathan Sperber, just concluded his, you know, career by writing an important biography of Marx, hmm. um, because being a student of the Revolution of 1848 and being a student of Marx kind of goes hand in hand, um, and you know, just like a an American historian might write a biography of, of, of a central figure like Thomas Jefferson. Um, so, but perhaps even more strongly in the case of 1848. So he writes about, you know, there's, a, there's the last time that uh, the East India Company has its charter renewed in 1853. Hmm. Uh, there's a widespread debate in the British Parliament about that. Uh, Marx writes a number of, of articles. I've referred to some of them already, some of, you know, prompting some of his most famous uh, newspaper articles. He wrote a very great deal about the Crimean War, um, you know, from 1853 to 1855, a very important event in the 19th century uh, that, you know, a lot of Americans, but really uh, people in general, don't know much, that much about anymore. Um, and he wrote a great deal about the attempt to reboot um, British socialism, uh, what is known as Chartism, the great movement from 1838 to 1848. Uh, there was an attempt to kind of reboot it um, they had a lot of, of influence from Marx and Engels, and the close collaborator of theirs was at the head of that, uh, named Ernest Jones. Um, he writes a great deal about that. Uh, he writes about news, and in, in, he writes about the course of the, the Second Empire in France. He talks about you know, this, the struggle to unify Italy. 
and he writes a lot about uh, the lead up and early stages of the American Civil War. Um, he talks about the opium, Second Opium War in China. He talks about the 1857 revolt uh, in India. So the topics are vast and varied, and you know far exceed even that short summary. Um, you know what is he talking? What what is the themes that sort of run through it? Right, the red thread, maybe. Uh, the red thread is that he's really talking about a transformation in um, the nature of of history itself, if you will, uh, that you could you could shorthand it as the crisis of the project of expanding wealth and the expansion of liberal freedom and the incorporation of more and more countries and peoples into the project of that articulated by Enlightenment liberals of you know expanding wage labor, deepening the freedom of individuals, expanding human capacity to collectively control their destiny, and steadily eliminating the necessity for coercion in society. Um, you know, to, to just you know, be very casual about it, but basically, you know, the project that we associate with um, with with classical liberalism, from John Locke to Jean Jacques Rousseau uh, to Adam Smith to Immanuel Kant, you know, Thomas Jefferson, etc. This was a project of expanding human. Uh, capacity and you know, and consciousness to control their own destiny, to overcome uh, scarcity, to increasingly found their social relations not on uh, subordination, hierarchy, and domination, but on cooperation. And sociality. Um, that whole project for Marx is coming into crisis in, as a result, in the sense of its very success. Uh, so, you know, the shorthand way to put that is that it's resulting in the Industrial Revolution and the massive expansion of wage labor. Uh, that 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 is that that presupposes and also accelerates, um, and with that you start to get phenomena like unemployment that really can't be dealt with in the older liberal frame, and it also means that you know rather than liberal freedom sort of gradually spreading with each new wave of revolution. The spread of liberal institutions, of parliamentary institutions, of representative government, whether in Republican or monarchical form, uh, really kind of stops, even retreats, recoils upon itself. Uh, so, for instance, you know, freedom that once existed in Holland and, and then later in England and later in America and then later in France, that's sort of bouncing around, this sort of modern revolution that's bouncing around the Atlantic world in the 17th and 18th century and in the 19th century, you know, really fails to extend into, for instance, Germany um, or Italy or, for that matter, Central and South America. 
uh, or Canada. Um, there seems to be a crisis uh, in the, the geographical expansion of liberal freedom. And that is, you know, Marx sees that in the failure of, of a project of creating, you know, of a bourgeois revolution in Germany. You know, there really isn't a bourgeois revolution in Germany, even though he's uh, struggling for that and struggling to deepen and uh, radicalize that um, you know, into a socialist revolution in Germany. None of that really happens. Um, and instead, um, the classes that once had been at the, in the leadership of that kind of movement really come to support much more uh, conservative alternatives. But in France, you see, again, France is the most sort of avant-garde, advanced guard form of the modern problem. There, the question is directly posed of the rights of labor. Um, you know, putting people to work, creating jobs for the jobless. That was called um, the social question, I think. That's called the social question. Mm -hmm. What do you do? With, there's a lot of old words, um, you know, that we don't use anymore, but we still deal with these problems. Yeah. You know, they would talk about, in the 19th century, they'd talk about, like, pauperism. Right? Pauperism was a, a problem that shocked people. In the 1840s, um, they were known as the Hungry Forties. You know, this was a period of of the Irish famine. Uh, there was widespread famine in Europe, especially among weavers, you know, people who tra practiced the traditional occupation of weaving. They were being put out of work by the products um, coming in to markets from you know British textile mills and the like. And so that's really, you know, what's conditioning uh, the revolution of 1848. And, you know, for Marx, you know, it's posing the question of the working class taking power as a class to address the contradictions in liberal freedom uh, that are really kind of concentrated in their condition. Um, and, and so that's why for Marx, it's not just like working people, but what he calls the proletariat, um, you know, a condition of people who can't put themselves to work, don't have tools, you know, have to work for other people, you know, you have to go to work, you have to go get a job, right? Um, people can't just be like candy craftsmen. Um, and yet there may not be enough jobs. And they can't rely on, um, historically, what would have been a, a, a place that they could have fit into. Like, they're just, they're just orphaned, basically, by this uh, um, turn to what Marx calls capital. Right. So they're increasingly, you know, urban, and in that sense, bourgeois, over pertaining to the city. Um... And they they can't go back to you know their peasant or serf existence. You know they're depending upon this new freedom of wage labor, which of course does promise a great emancipation uh, in comparison to what had been before. Um, but precisely as this crisis of capitalism is deepening, it's, it you know, takes a kind of a manifest expression of, of unemployment. It has many other dimensions. The state is called to kind of manage this crisis in as much as like revolutionary politics uh, by you know, bringing about a working class seizure of power. Right, what what um, 
you know, Marx calls the dictatorship of the proletariat um, in the immediate aftermath of 1848. Um, you know, he sees that as the kind of innermost tendency of the revolution, that it's driving towards the working class taking power and leading uh, other classes of society. Um, and he wants to push that tendency and to clarify that tendency. Um, insofar as it fails, society manages its crisis through a re, really a rebirth and a kind of a repurposing of the state. Um, the state who's you know, that had been you know, steadily subordinated to society and you know, the coercive character of the state had been giving way to um, the rule of law in the bourgeois revolution you know, really gets a kind of a new impetus and that impetus is to manage the crisis of society, to manage, um, you know, the not only the joblessness, but all of the, you know, morbid symptoms that arise from joblessness, especially when you're thinking about like the, like rendering permanent of joblessness. Um, you know, what you're talking about is kind of endemic criminality. Um, you're talking about, um, you know, the, you know, what we think of as, you know, all of the problems that kind of can't be addressed, um, you know, the kind of intractable problems like drug addiction, homelessness, criminality, gangs, right? These phenomena are really date from the 19th century <laughs> as as do, as do um, their corollary or their necessary counterpart, which is the police. The, the, the police as an institution did not really exist, um, you know, in in the 18th century or in the mind of 18th century revolutionaries. Uh, so, for instance, you know, the modern police is really sort of dubiously. Uh, constitutional, uh, if you really think about it, you know there are um, you know, there are clauses in the Bill of Rights against standing armies, you know, standing bodies of standing bodies of armed men, so to speak, quartering on and occupying society. That's the crisis um, you're yeah. referring to, right? It, like the crisis right, but, is know, that society needs those structures instead of uh, yeah, being we, more social. You know, you, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people, you know, how many tens of thousands of police officers there are in Houston. Um, you know, but Houston is under armed occupation um, by the police. And, you know, probably most people wish that there were more <laughs> you know, police officers. Right, because 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 the police, um, you know, are you know you could you could put it positively, um, you know, and sound conservative and say, well, then you know, they're necessary. Yeah, they, um, they uh, enforce you know. order. Well, who's against order? That's right, and so the, the really the watchwords of of modern democratic society. You know, become family, property, religion, and order, uh, rather than liberty, equality, and fraternity. Right? This is uh, one of the hallmarks of the transformation that takes place um, in and through the failure of the Revolution of 1848. You know, is that you know, democratic demand for order? Um, you know, and, and, it, and, and of course it's impossible to oppose it sort of squarely. I mean, I guess we kind of came close 
um, you know, in the um, opposition between defund the police and law and order uh, in recent elections. But, you know, really, you'll notice that the Democrats are, you know, are extremely embarrassed by and run away from defunding the police, and, and perhaps rightly so, because you know, abolishing the police, uh, you know, certainly from a Marxist perspective, can only really be accomplished by abolishing the necessity of the police. Um, you know, it, it doesn't do any good, you know, to, to abolish the police when you still have all of the social ills that, that produce them. I mean, you can enact various reforms, uh, certainly. But, you know, the, the underlying question isn't, you know, police versus social workers or in whatever, you know, fairly degenerate way we debate that question. Uh, but really, you know, what is it about this society that produces, you know, the need, uh, you know, for a man with a gun to be only a phone call away? Right. The, the uh, point being, uh, look how far we have reduced things or we have conceded things if if we just want a police force that's not racist when like the um, original um, emancipatory well, idea right. is to not have any police at all but to have a society which is ordered of its own you know free will that's right you know and of course you know we know that 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 happens i mean almost all you know most people, most of the time, um, you know, in fact, most people throughout their whole lives, and, you know, let's hope it's the case, you know, won't need the police, you know, don't encounter the police. Um, but their presence and, and the underlying, um, you know, transformation of the nature of the authority of the, of the state the growth of executive power, uh, the undermining of liberal representation. All of these things go together, you know, in, you know, for Marx. That you really, you have to have a massive expansion of, of bureaucracy and, ex- and government by executive order to be able to, to manage the ongoing crisis of society. And that smacks and, of uh, what you call Bonapartism, or you're looking at the seeds of that. And we only have really like seven minutes or less, so I'm mm-hmm. talking to mm-hmm. uh, Spencer Leonard on Living Art, Michael Woodson here on uh, KPFT 90.1 FM. And this is uh, a two-part conversation. Uh, we're live, and we'll be live next week uh, doing the same thing. Uh, but anyway, I think I might have uh, cut you short there. Just wanted to give you no, a heads no. up. We have five minutes. No, that's great. Uh, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, Michael. Um, you know, I, I just, I, you know, what I'm trying to do with these books is to open up an older, um, you know, really the, the, the conception of, 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 of Karl Marx and his ideas uh, that influenced uh, historical Marxism itself. Um, you know what were the what were the things that people, you know, really learned from Marx to the point that they called themselves followers of Marx or, or Marxists. Um, and and I would say that in many ways, um, you know, when you get away from that, you are there's a real danger there because. Um, you know, why do we care about Karl Marx? You know, really, you know, we care about Karl Marx because he did inspire this um, you know, radical current uh, within socialism, one that ultimately you know, came to lead socialism, came to dominate socialism. Of course, there's they're non-Marxist socialisms, um, but you, know, in the period of its greatest strength, when there were mass socialist parties 
in the United States and in the countries of Europe. Marxism was a crucial strain within it. And in that sense, um, you know, the significance of Marx can't be divorced from um, the history, which of course is a, a, you know, a very problematic history, a very fraught history, a very, um, you know, really a historical impasse, uh, you know, rather than any kind of set of lessons. Um, you know, that's what Marx is inextricably bound up with. And so yeah. these books are kind of pitched directly into that problem, you know, right into the heart of that um, abyss. Right? Yeah, I was going to say that uh, it's the defeats mm-hmm. that um, really have to be looked at, and we don't like to do that. That's right, and and that's, I think, why people kind of get away from the political marks. Um, you know, and it's, it's not that they're, you know, to go sort of bring it around and perhaps wind up our conversation for the day, uh, it's really that, you know, Paul, that, that all of Marx's concerns philosophically and in terms of economics or political economy uh, and the like, you know, they all come down to, and they all can only really make sense uh, if you understand that they are all subordinated to and really find their coherence in a revolutionary political project. It's not that you, you can't really take the revolutionary political project out of Marx and have anything worth discussing, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, I, I don't know if you, you know, have any questions or I think we're probably out of time, but, uh, I, like I say, I'm so, so happy that you invited me and, and that I'm going to be able to do this again. Um, people can get in touch. They can, they can write to me. Um, and if they have any questions that they want me to address in the second half, um, at my, Email address, it's S A L E O N A R. It looks like sale on A R, uh, but I'm not an assault rifle dealer. <laughs> it's, just my, it's just my first two initials and Leonard without the final D at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, thanks again, Michael. Yeah, uh, it's been my pleasure. I think. Uh Next week, we'll we'll take up from uh, where we left off here, and I've got just a ton of questions. And the thing about doing radio, I think, is is you really have to hold back because you have to think of your audience, and you can't move too fast. And, and anyway, there's just so much to say, so much to learn, and uh, we appreciate you uh, contributing uh, your time to us here in Houston, you know, to, um, to further that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um. I, yeah, and I, I, I look forward to listening to the recording. I'm sure I'll be very critical and think about how to say things uh, you know, perhaps a little bit more straightforwardly. But cool. For now, I hope that was helpful. That should do it. And I'll say good, uh, goodbye and good night. Good, goodbye and good night to you, Michael. Thanks again. Thank you, Spencer. All the best. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Good evening. Welcome to Living Art. I'm Michael Woodson here at KPFT 90.1 FM, Houston HD1, streamed and archived on kpft.org. We really, really, really appreciate you uh, tuning in. And tonight we have part two of um, Living Art's interview with uh, Spencer Leonard, who is a sociology teacher at uh, James Madison University. He's a uh, founding member of the Platypus Affiliated Society, and he's got just lots of articles and videos out there. And I said last week he's uh, mild-mannered in appearance, but he also can be ferocious and daring, a very um, interesting personality. There's a whole lot to say about him, but you have a Google machine, and and you can listen to all kinds of uh, lectures 
and read all kinds of articles if you just um, Google Spencer Leonard. He's got um, a couple of books coming out, forthcoming books uh, by, about, uh, having articles uh, in them by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Uh, One book is titled Marx and Engels on Bonapartism, Selected Journalism, 1851 to 59, and that's got an amazing uh, essay on uh, the turn in history from uh, the bourgeois uh, revolution to uh, uh, proletarian liberation politics. And his second uh, book that's going to be forthcoming is Marx and Engels on Imperialism, Selected Journalism, 1856 to... um, uh, I think later date in maybe 1861 or something. Anyway, welcome, uh, Spencer Leonard, to Living Art. Thanks, Michael. It's good to be back. Uh, Really, we appreciate so much you uh, breaking away from your holiday schedule and and, and sharing your time with us. No problem. I wanted to... uh, Go ahead. I was was just going to say, this way I, I, I get spared my family's initial initial experiments with the new christmas air fryer so, <laughs> what's that about thanks for thanks for delivering me from that <laughs> are you on, my brother are you on a fat-free diet uh no i'm not um but it's just it's just you know more fun with household appliances in america <laughs> um how are you uh, pretty good, pretty good. I uh, visited with my sister today. She uh, had a layover coming in from Thailand. Uh, she vacationed there. And so I was able to oh, wow. pick her up from the airport and go to Ninfa's, uh, the original Ninfa's, which is a great Mexican restaurant here. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, you know, it's hard to, like, shift gears from the holiday season to uh, this uh, this heavy material on, on Marx and Engels' journalism and their writing. But uh, I think we're up to. Oh, the it's a Marx is a is a is a great Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I wanted to talk to you tonight about. You can talk about anything you want. Uh, really, it's uh, free form. But you know, it strikes me mm. uh, having uh, studied um, Marx with our group, the Platypus Affiliated Society, uh, that he he writes in so many different forms. Uh, you know, he's uh, obviously known for uh, writing uh, Capital, which is political economy. Uh, he wrote pamphlets. Uh, you s- are working on his journalism. You might say that he r- writes a kind of a philosophy in the register of philosophy, in the register of history with uh, class struggles in France and with the 18th Brumaire. And I just wanted to, um, I mean, we don't normally think of Marx, you know, as a writer of all these different forms. And, um, you know, I'm sure you're capable of taking that idea in some direction. Uh, it just uh, right. it occurs to me, I guess, my thoughts are that, um, you know, initial thoughts are, are that he is all of those and none of those, and that he sort of is um, at the root sort of a, a revolutionary um a political figure, uh, but the forms them, themselves speak to um, how he uh, uses whatever forms uh, uh, that speak revolution. Why? I mean, I think that um, the I, I'll, I'll take um, Lenin as an example. Lenin was a great reader of Marx. And he, you know, a, a very, really a very serious student, and he said, uh, of Marx's writings, and he said, you know, Marx doesn't really write as Marx until 1847, The Poverty of Philosophy. And it's a strange place to start, uh, or, you know, one could think of it as fairly arbitrary, but what I would say is that, uh, in a lot of ways, you know, first of all, you know, Marx is just a 
is just a great Victorian writer. He, he, he's a great writer of a time when, and I think we talked a little bit about this uh, last week, uh, you know, I, but I think the point is especially apropos today, uh, where you know education, particularly on the left, uh, is is so degraded, um, and and there's so much you know miseducation on so many levels uh, that you know for one thing you know, just the, the, the profound resources of writing and you know obviously writing prose are you know disparaged unrecognized etc so marx is like any great 19th century writer in that uh you know he just seems to 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 use language uh you know with a fuller range than you know, most of what we read, which is, you know, there are a lot of false idols, there are a lot of false authorities, you know, uh, people have notions about rules of grammar and how things are to be written, uh, and they, they really don't understand, you know, the, the, what mastery can entail. Uh, but to get back to my point, um, you know, there is a time when Marx, as it were, doesn't write as Marx, to use Lenin's phrase. And really what that means, uh, not to sound too cryptic, is that he is writing as Marx. Uh, we think of Marx, uh, when we think of Marx's writings, we're thinking about writing that is disciplined by um, his connection to the socialist workers' movement. Um, and anyone who, you know, reads Marx's, for instance, his dissertation, um, you know, which of course is disciplined by other kind of, you know, constraints, most obviously the academic, uh, but, you know, academia in the 19th century was a very different animal. Mm -hmm. Uh, his dissertation's pretty hard to read, uh, and it's pretty... Um, you know, prolific in figures of speech, and it, you know, it's quite poetic at times. Um, and you know, it, it's not meant to be you know widely understood. Where, whereas Marx, uh, you know, I think he makes a self-conscious effort to to communicate um, in almost all of his writing uh, as he becomes more and more clear in his own mind about his politics and um, you know actually advancing those politics sometimes you know in party organs and the like you know we, we talked about some of the complexity of that last week about how he might or might not be re be writing for a friendly editor politically speaking he might or might not be uh, writing for money um, so forth and so on, but yeah, you know, there's so, so there's sort of the fact that, you know, so what I'm trying to highlight to you, Michael, and we can dig further into this, mm -hmm. is simply the first thing to, the first thing to understand before we get into like all the questions of the genres that you raised, uh, is that um, if we experience uh, Marx as difficult, shall we say, uh, he's only difficult in the way that 19th century writers in general are difficult, or writers from the past in general are difficult. He's not being deliberately difficult. Um, you know, he is writing to communicate, especially in, you know, the as and when he grows uh, clearer about his politics. What is difficult about Marx is that the kind of preconditions of being able to write party literature or for socialism, what what he could presuppose, even, you know, if you'll allow me, uh, in amongst workers, amongst the working class, you know, the kinds of 
you know, what he could presuppose as something they would understand that they would take for granted. Uh, a lot of those assumptions uh, are, are not readily available to us and sort of have to be actively reconstructed. Uh, it would be like um, understanding, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, that um, S- Star Wars is uh, a movie made in the genre of you know science fiction and and um, and I don't know maybe uh, Gene Roddenberry's influence on Star Wars or something like that would um, would be understood to a, a, a current uh, lover of science fiction movies. Yeah, or, you know, or to give even like a more kind of exotic idea, um, you know, like. W- the strangeness of like trying to read say the Homeric epics without understanding like how in what circumstances poetry would have been recited in the classical world of the Homeric period, like that it had a religious function, that it had a ritual function, that there were all sorts, you know, that it wasn't meant to be like a penguin classic you know hmm. book that you read like quietly by yourself right but uh, it's sort of like that like the whole like presupp- I'm not saying that you know Marx's writings are akin you know, the, the, that the circumstances were like ancient religion I'm saying that you know there's just a lot that's being presupposed when you you know that if you think of Homer, um, that to really, to really contemplate it, you know, you, you kind of have to think about that. Like, you know, that this was like, you know, I don't know what, you know, this is like the poetry of Vikings, you know, that <laughs> they would <laughs> recite before they would go off marauding or something. You know, this is war poetry amongst, um, you know, a, a, a almost pre-civilized people or, you know, very warlike people. You know, it's like that. It, 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 that mm-hmm. context is, in many ways, uh, perhaps less distant. You know, we live in a, a world that's full of like bizarre, you know, religion and war, uh, but we don't live in a world where there are mass socialist, you know, the mass socialist movements amongst the working class. Um, you know, that would understand, like, why it was important to criticize political economy or to write about recent historical events or political events in a particular register or, you know, can even read um, newspapers critically. Um it makes me think but, of the Communist Manifesto and, and uh, you know, how he's, uh, you know, like you have to carry an understanding that he's he's uh, critiquing different socialist movements at the same time uh, that he's advocating um, the problem with uh, capitalism, something like that. Like we just don't carry the critique of socialism with us as we read the Communist Manifesto. Would that be kind of close to what you're thinking? Right, you know, and just the very fact that it's a political manifesto, you know, that, that um, I mean, it's a, you know, as he says, it's a sort of a spectral political party more than like an actual political party. But, you know, of course, there was the Communist League that commissioned it, um, you know, that it was commissioned, um, you know, by an organization to which, you know, which could claim, you know, the allegiance of, of you know, at least thousands of of members of the working class, and that it was expected that you know they would approve, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, you in know, other words, you may not get like, his core, some core thinking that uh, you you find in in uh, reading his his entire entire oeuvre. Right. You know. I mean, I don't. We could think like. Um, you know, everybody talks about like you know, working class movements today. You know, they're, they're going to unionize a Starbucks. 
right? And at the Starbucks, you know, in the Starbucks unionization, you know, when other unionizations, you know, they might come to talk about the Democratic Party and they might come to talk about, uh, the, you know, it's just, uh, you know, listening to a, a kind of a Bernie sister, um, Brianna Joy Gray, the um, former campaign manager of Bernie Sanders, talked about how she's leaving the Democratic Party. Democratic Party is dead. They might come to the idea that they need a new political party. They may even have the rudiments of that political party. And they might, you know, you, you would have to imagine, like, people, you know, who were, like, workers, who were, on the one hand, like, struggling with their bosses, also talking about, like, different leftist intellectuals and saying, you know, the, the ones that we really need to draft our manifesto are these crazy <laughs> podcasters or whatever, right? The Marsh and Ingalls, like those guys, right? we we got to get them to write our party manifesto because we, we're going to get ourselves organized here and, and, and we're going we're gonna to overthrow capitalism. Um, you know, so we got to get, we got to get the good guys, you know, the people who really know what they're talking about and then to have people eagerly read what had been commissioned, you know, and of course, presumably to, uh, approve or disapprove. Um, right. So it's, it's that kind of thing. That's what I mean by saying that, you know, it, it goes well beyond just sort of mere literacy. Um, you know, there's sort of the literacy question and the complexity of any kind of reading uh, from the past. Uh, but for us, there's this absent context, which and this is the last wrinkle I'll put into it, Michael, mm. which is it's a context that we can believe we understand or that we share, but we don't, right? There's the idea that we have that there is a left, and we read Marx and Engels and we think, well, they're leftists and we're leftists. And so this is like an old book, but, you know, an oldie but a goodie, um, you know, a classic or something. And you, you you think it has like immediate application, but it doesn't. It doesn't have immediate application because actually the context is radically different in a way that is that that is actually ideologically masked, right? So that one of the most basic problems in accessing Marx is that he is both farther away and nearer to our time uh, than you know I think people might sort of readily suspect or grasp go ahead well I just want to say that uh, we are listening you are listening to living art we're talking to Spencer Leonard who is a um, well, in this case, uh, we're celebrating his editorship of uh, two books on Marx's journalism, Farther Away and Nearer. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to work with that idea so that we can... Sort well, of he's far away in the sense that, you know, the prospect for socialism, you know, really doesn't exist. I mean, for there to be a prospect for socialism, uh, there really needs to be a movement for socialism. It, it needs to, to, as it were, um, answer to and express and develop a felt need in society. Um, we don't have that movement for socialism. At the same time, um, you know, and, and and, and the reason we don't have it, and this is why, you know, there's something, um, there's something spectral about the way the specter of communism haunts us, we're, as it were, doubly haunted in that sense. Um, it feels like we're still in capitalism. It feels like we live in a world that 
ought to have a movement for socialism. It feels like, in fact, that there is. Uh, it feels like we've made progress, and this is what progress looks like. Okay, so it may not, it may not be that we have these older for other forms, but we have these newer forms of the left. Uh, you know, but really, when you probe into that, you know, it, that, that these are this is what I'm suggesting is a bit of an ideological illusion. Uh, it marks us farther away because um, you know, we because because the left itself in the course of the 20th century has really buried uh, the meaning of socialism, buried and obscured it uh, to such a degree that. Um, yeah, it's not really clear what the, you, know, in, in, you know how to take um, you know how to take Marx, how to take Marxism, how to like, how to re, you know to to put it in your terms, how to read it. Um, you know these these texts feel um, you know both completely dated and you know far ahead of our time. You know we 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 are. Um, both beyond them and uh, have regressed seriously behind them. Yeah, it's kind of disheartening, and and uh, you know, I think about some of the the uh, insights that I have, uh, you know, like uh, in discovering um, the Eighteenth Brumaire, um, and mm -hmm. just like being bowled over about how brilliant it is, and it instantly became like. Uh, one of my favorites as like the greatest piece of writing ever, you know, up there with Hamlet or something. Right? <laughs> and, and then here I am. It, 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 is, it is. It is. Absolutely. But my point is you I'm know, celebrating yeah. it in a kind of isolation, right? And, you know, an aesthetic or something. And I don't know, like your message is really heavy to me because, you know, what is that, that I, I can see the brilliance and I can see the urgency of it. And am I just you know? And then I'm just kidding myself necessarily, right? Uh, thinking it goes somewhere if the state of uh, of you know what it takes to to supersede to transform capital uh, is nowhere to be found. Right. So I'll I'll just uh, you know because I'm at home, I'm sort of thinking home thoughts and you know and also long life thoughts. Um, you know, I, I have an older brother who, you know, of course is uh, uh, my oldest and dearest friend, hmm. and because he's older, you know, I used to learn a lot from him, and he had a, a, a kind of an intellectual friend, and, you know, we would always have great intellectual discussions when I was young. And we would read, you know, and we would recommend books to each other, as, as people do, as young people do. Uh, and, you know, it would be James Joyce this, and, you know, Kafka that, and, and, and Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the other thing. And, you know, uh, I don't know, um, you know, Confessions of an English Opium Eater. And, you know, finally, I, you know, I... I it, of course, when I was younger, I received more recommendations than I gave. But as I as I started going to college and thinking a lot, you know, I started to recommend more books. And I remember recommending Marx and and another thinker named Gerd Lukacs uh, to uh, particularly to, to this friend of my brother's. You know, and he was like, it was the first time that he ever came back, and he was like, you know, that one just didn't land with me. Um, you know, it, we, we couldn't talk about it. Like he just didn't get it. Like he, he wasn't moved by it. He didn't know what the point was. Um, and I feel like you know, it's sort of like us. You know, we're here. We are. We love. We love reading Marx. Um, we love thinking about it, and we form like a, a small little you know appreciation society for the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. You know, what a brilliant book. But it's not the sort of book that you can hand somebody, you know, and just say, hey, man, like, 
You ever read this? It's great. Um, you know, they they might read it and be like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they were, really, you're right. Yeah. Um, and and it's because of a lot of reasons. It's it's because it it's talking about things that are unfamiliar, quite literally, like historical events that are unfamiliar. But the events of the Revolution of 1848 in France, the course of the Revolution of 1848 in France, and it's invoking the comparison with the events of the, of the Great Revolution of 1789 to 1815, um, but it really is unfamiliar in a deeper way. You know, the whole conception of politics. Uh, the whole way of thinking in that book is, you know, it takes, you know, you, I could teach a class on that book. You, you could take, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks just explaining everything that's being presupposed to make possible an informed reading. And that's where we've, you know, that's where we've, where we've come and you know, it's it goes way beyond context. Really, you have to what you really have to convince someone of to be able to to read the 18th Brumaire is that you know socialism could have succeeded, <laughs> 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 or we ought to be we ought to have been living in socialism for the last hundred years. Like you really have to come to that to be able to read this one book from 1852. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's kind of you know a little bit mind bending. This is living art. Um, you're listening to Spencer Leonard tonight. Uh, he's got a couple of books out on uh, Marx and Engels journalism, and the station is KPFT ninety point one FM Houston HD one. I'm Michael Woodson. S- so, I guess Ben's. Um, like moving mm-hmm. towards asking you uh, a question about history because like right. it seems to me a lot of this uh, you call it uh, what is presupposed right uh, mm-hmm. is 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 a concept of history and I find in talking with you the need to fight um, a sort of a positive or affirmative understanding, and and that comes from, uh, in a range from the kind of understanding that the uh, right wing nuts uh, uh, do in e- in uh, evoking Marx's name as Satan to uh, um, you know any any uh, kind of communism that uh, and Marx communism that you might find in politics and in the ac- academic world and. It right. seems like what what's missing is a kind of um, a sense of history that would take socialism seriously. Uh, you know, here we're in a position of like correcting the world, and of course that's a frightful idea too, right? It's fraught. But isn't like mm-hmm. don't you have to understand um, like history is is uh, socialism, and that's such a foreign concept, I believe, to um, how we live and where we live. Right. So, you know, let me try to maybe concretize that and and maybe even um, make it a little bit more basic uh, for your listeners. You know, because you know, disclaimer: uh, I've I've talked to Michael before, <laughs> and. And we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't presuppose too much. Um, you, I'll, I'll give you an example with reference to these books that you're referring to. Um, you know, I, I, so there's these these writings, this journalism that I've edited uh, from the 1850s by Marx and Engels. It's all you know. We talked about it last week. It's all in a, you know, kind of an elaboration of the 18th Brumaire. Um, you know, an elaboration of, of what Marxists would call uh, the lessons of 1848. Um, you know, the, the way that Marxist thought developed and deepened as a result 
of his experience of the revolution of 1848. And it's written in a period of counter-revolution, you might call it, what a normal historian would call a counter-revolution. Um, it's, it's, it's a counter-revolution that followed the revolution of 1848, just as past revolutions had developed um, counter-revolutions and uh, perhaps um, defeats and restorations and so forth, restorations of the old order. That's the period that he's writing in. Marx doesn't think that it's a, as it were, normal or uh, that if he doesn't think it's a counter-revolution on the analogy of the past. He thinks something has changed uh, about the counter-revolution uh, because he thinks something has changed about revolution in history. Um, that the revolution of 1848 is, it has, was grappling with a kind of a re-specified or transformed uh, formulation of the older questions. Uh, that it isn't just the older questions uh, being fought out again. Uh, he also so so the, because the revolution is different, the counter revolution is different. Uh, he he thinks that that counter revolution is. Uh, Bonapartist or imperialist, those are the titles of the books. They're, they're really two volumes. Um, you know, one is called On Bonapartism and one of them is On Imperialism, but those words are used interchangeably uh, by Marx and Engels, and so I use those two terms to indicate that these are, these are companion volumes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's where Marx develops uh, you know, the concept of authoritarianism. Um, where he develops his conceptions of a capitalist state. We talked about all that a little bit last week. Um, so in many ways, the counter-revolution is kind of darker. Um, it, it, it's more um, menacing. It seems, you know, he, he does reference this in... Um, the 18th Brumaire, where he says that the revolution of 1848 conquered no new ground, so to speak, for history. Whereas uh, the revolution of 1789, the, the Great French Revolution, and the revolution of 1776, perhaps more obviously, since it was, quote, successful, unquote, uh, and the French was, quote, failed or defeated, unquote, whether successful or defeated, they had advanced history. They had conquered new ground. They had advanced human freedom in a way that couldn't readily be reversed or seemingly couldn't be reversed. Whereas the Revolution of 1848, uh, it seemed that even um, the gains of the past were being lost games like, um, say, the rule of law. Um, and yet, so Marx is, is living in a counter-revolutionary period. We might think that we're living in a counter-revolutionary period, whether in a general or specific sense. We might think that things have been going bad, you know, the left has lots of ideas. Things have been going bad for the left since the 60s, so they've been going bad for the left since the 30s. Or they've been going bad for the left, you know, more profit, proximally, uh, you know, since the defeat of Bernie Sanders, shall we say, mm -hmm. or the failure to expand the squad. Um, but the difference is, is that Marx thought that history was still happening uh, underneath the surface. Uh, a, a revolution, you know, he has an image of the old mole of, of history, that it's burrowing beneath the ground. Um, it's actually a, it's, it's a reference to the, to the opening scene of, of Shakespeare's Hamlet, 
um, where you know, young Prince Hamlet compares uh, his father's ghost um, to, to a mole burrowing into the ground. Um, and, and this is an image that's been taken up by Hegel and then by Marx and then by Rosa Luxemburg as the mole of history. It's a presence that you can't see. It's undermining the stability of the present or haunting and, and, and driving events so you can't see it. And Marx still believes that that's happening in, in the 1850s, uh, even though he he's living in poverty. His friends are either betraying the revolution, they're betraying the, their own politics, or they're dying of starvation. I mean, there it's it's a dark time uh, in. 1852, 53, on through the 50s. Um, and, and, and it's that part that we don't have anymore, uh, really. You know, we don't really have a sense that um, history is comprehensible, uh, that we can understand the, you know, like where we are in its course, whether in, you know, whether in a moment of despair or, you know, trying to steer things in, you know, a period of upswing and dynamism. All of that's, you know, it's very hard. The way, that, the way that history appears to us is much more uh, fragmentary um, and, and in many ways um, treacherous. And, and so I would say that, and that has to do with, you know, essentially the catastrophes of the 20th century, or the catastrophe of the 20th century, uh, which is the world historic defeat of the socialist workers' movement with no new project really taking its place. Socialism died in, in, in Europe and in America in the core of capitalism, Japan, um, you know, wherever we think of as the core of capitalism, there isn't really a, a socialist workers' movement, uh, and there hasn't been for, for quite some time. Um, you know, none that is really on the ascendant and driving you know, the, the course of history. Um, so that loss, that 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 development is. It discombobulates our entire sense. So, to, to to try to sum up these long comments, what I'm trying to say to you, Michael, is there's there's sort of the sense of history as the unfolding of freedom, uh, you know, that it's steadily getting more and more free, that we're develop, we're conquering more and more ground uh, for human freedom, which was the sense that bourgeois revolutionaries had, uh, let's say, from the English Civil War to the 1830s, to the revolution of Marx and Engels' childhood, the Revolution of 1830. Uh, the July uh, Revolution in France, the passing of the Great Reform Bill in 1832 in England, etc. Um, and then there's the sense of the crisis of that project uh, under socialism, and that it really is about uh, the tasks of the old revolution of conquering more and more ground for human freedom and more and more ground for human self-determination um, and autonomy um, through the mastery of the crisis of freedom that's expressed to socialism and not just a, of course, I'm trying to convince. And then there's the crisis of history that's, as it were, merely opaque and, and I think bound up in kind of repetition compulsions, um, you know, sort of a cycling uh, spiral of regression and repetition uh, that we experience, the way that we're haunted by a past that we seem unable to recover, the, the past of, of the history of socialism and that project, and the inability to, as it were, definitively break with that project and undertake a new one either. You know, there's a way that Marx uh, haunts the present. Uh, there's a way that uh, that old project haunts the present. I wish it weren't the case. I wish we didn't care about Marx. I wish we were embarked on, as it were, a new epoch of human freedom, you know, beyond the struggle for socialism. But it seems that we're not. Um, it seems like we're somehow 
grappling with the same problem, and, and, and that is a, it, it, that changes the character, to get back to your point, of the experience of history in a fundamental way. I think it's one of the difficult things about reading, Marx, and I guess I'm going to bring this to your journalism, try not to leave things so open-ended. Here on Living Art with mm-hmm. Michael Woodson talking to Spencer Leonard, and, and, and that is, uh, if I'm saying this right, the sui generis or the original kind of um, uh, voice of Marx, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I'll put it in the word dialectical or whatever, and to me that, that uh, yep. speaks to a history that um, we can't imagine because we send, we tend to reify or, or cap off our expectations of, let's say, socialism as a welfare state and everybody having what they need or something, which, um, of course, we don't object to. But it sort of just closes things off as if this were a big dog kennel or something. And it sort of takes out the idea that um, there's meaning, meaning in life. And, and uh, when you read Marx, I think it, it gets very um, um, complicated, it, to put it in a simple word. It gets difficult to read be, uh, because I think he wants to push the boundaries of, of you know, what is or reality or, you know, the, the, the possible transformation mm-hmm. being something that we don't, we don't, uh, you know, we, we, we haven't, we can't understand it because we haven't brought it about yet. So um, that's saying a lot. Mm-hmm. Sorry if I was carrying on there, but no, uh, no. But the journalism no. is, is there something um, like the, uh, original in in, in that um, the way Marx handles um, uh, is taking a lot for granted, like um, Capital or, or the Communist Manifesto or his histories, where you know it's just not straightforward, but he's kind of provoking. Um, 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 uh, forward and backward way of looking at at uh, his subject. Yes, so I mean, I would say that um, you know, to, just to pick up on some of the the sort of bigger concepts in what you you're asking about, uh, and to try to explain them a little bit uh, for your listeners. You know, there was this way of of, of writing and thinking that kind of didn't need a name um, for a long time, uh, but it was thinking about freedom and thinking about the historical unfolding of, of human freedom, and that that required uh, thinking with the with as you if you will the logic of freedom, um, thinking with the with the logic of a human society uh, that is coming to consciousness of its own potential and its own, if you will, self-incurred immaturity, to, to put it in Kantian terms, that it, becoming conscious of the fact that it's unfree and that it could potentially become freer. Uh, and the word for the thinking like that and writing about that uh, was it is inevitably in the aftermath of the work of of the great philosopher uh, Hegel. The word that we use for that is dialectics. Um, it's not a mystified concept. It's not a mystical concept. It's it's a concept of of thinking a specific kind of object, uh, which is which is human freedom. Um, you know, and the logic that's appropriate to that, uh, as opposed, to, you know, to other, perhaps, um, more simple notions of, of logic. Um, and Marx is in the tradition of of thinking about freedom that is inherited from the 17th and 18th centuries that hopefully a lot of your listeners have heard read about, including, for instance, the American Founding Fathers might be the most familiar to an American audience. And those men were, um, you know, card-carrying members of the Enlightenment. Uh, Figures like Thomas Jefferson stand out there, Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin. Of course, there was a vast uh, body of their comrades, 
many of their comrades across Europe. Marx is thinking about, um, and, and so there's something, let me put it to you this way, there's something sui generis about the thinking of freedom. There's something that can't be explained with reference to prior causes uh, that, that, that seems to have its origin in itself about the, uh, about the Enlightenment, about, you know, the, we can talk about you know, the, the role that the classics played or indeed the role that the Christian heritage played uh, you know, in the Enlightenment, but ultimately it's something entirely new. And so if we were to talk about, for instance, modern philosophy, we would think of that, uh, especially if we are uh, thinking in the tradition of Hegel, we would think about modern philosophy as really having a different object, being really a different thing altogether in a fundamental way, but there's something sui generis about that. Um, now, there's something sui generis about the consciousness of the crisis of freedom, of the modern revolution, of the dialectic of history. Uh, and that's what really the significance of Marx and Engels are. Uh, they are the, in some ways, unrivaled. Um, it's a little bit different than thinking about the Enlightenment, because the Enlightenment is kind of an open-ended category. Um, you know, almost you know, to some degree, you know, most 18th century thinkers participate in it um, to some, to a greater or lesser extent. You can think about someone like Edmund Burke, who was both a counter-revolutionary thinker. He opposes the French Revolution, but he's also a member of the Enlightenment, wrote a classic treatise on, on aesthetics, for instance. Um, and... And so, you know, if we think about a category of enlightenment, it really would include dozens, hundreds of, of people, maybe even thousands of writers, uh, if we think about all the minor uh, contributors to it. Whereas there's nothing quite like Marx and Engels, because there's the consciousness of the crisis of freedom in the sense that there's the consciousness of the fact that socialism is trying to advance the modern revolution as a whole, that the working class is somehow it's you know, standing forth as a section of society that nevertheless bears the universal task of the emancipation of society, the advancing of freedoms in, in human history. Um, and, and Marx and Engels are sort of you know, their level of clarity about that you know, is so much greater and so and, and and their clarity comes from criticizing the other socialists um, in a way that makes it difficult to just say that they are socialists like dozens of other socialists uh, that there's a there's a second phase of the Enlightenment, the socialist phase, the 19th century phase, and they're just outstanding members of it. They're in some ways um, unique in their relationship to socialism, uh, especially given the fact that you know, there later was this thing called Marxism that, that came to lead and, and dominate the, the global socialist movement, you know, the world socialist movement. Um, so I think that, you know, with, so, so there's something sui generis about their reflections on the sui generis character of, of modern revolution at its crisis. <laughs> I hope my, uh, I, I hope you guys are listening, your, your listeners are following that. Um, right, that there's something unique about Marx and Engels. A phrase that we throw around, um, you know, that, that, that I think I quote in my book is that we can say that Marx and Engels are philosophes of a second enlightenment. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a closed group in the sense that there aren't a, bu a bunch of other such philosophes. If we were generous, you know, we could speak about, you know, all of their uh, colleagues and comrades and precursors. And, you know, they, they themselves are particularly generous towards their precursors, towards the early socialists like 
uh, like Charles Fourier and, and Saint Simon and, and Robert Owen um, and, and others who they think um, you know are are important figures um, in registering uh, the crisis of modern revolution in, in, in various ways that ultimately they in the most generous moments would say they're advancing and clarifying. Uh, whereas with respect to their contemporaries, they tend to be less generous. And then, you know, and there's good reason for them to be less generous because a lot of their contemporaries lose their way. Uh, a lot of their, you know, radicals tend to, you know, in, in the age of capitalism, uh, you know, they tend to become apologists for the status quo that they once uh, seemingly opposed or, or worse, you know, socialists become anti-Semites, socialists become the best capitalists, socialists, you know, start advising capitalist governments, right, uh, all sorts of things you know, that, that uh, you know, we're familiar with. Uh, and so that's what I would say about their journalism in particular, if we have time, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing. I mean, to, to say that there's something unique about uh, Marx and Engels' writing, um, it's, it's, it's hard to specify, you know, but it's always hard to specify. You, you have to really think about Marx, you know, to, to use perhaps a more familiar example, you know, is Marx's Das Kapital the last great work of classical political economy? Or is it a revolutionary socialist critique of the history of political economy? Well, it, it's both. Um, you know, and where does it, you know, where does the political economy end and the critique of political economy begin? Uh, you, you'd be hard pressed to, to specify that. You know, you certainly going to be able to identify a page number or a paragraph. Hmm. Uh, it, it runs throughout. Um, and so, with Marx's journalism, of course, he's much more constrained. Uh, his, 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 if you will, his genius uh, is operating within a tighter compass, and you know it is. Um, you know, he is disciplined by all sorts of you know relentless taskmasters like needing to make money. Um, you know, if he puts it, he has to keep the wolf from the door. I have a question. Maybe we can end with with this, yeah. which is uh, more contemporary. We have about um, I don't know four minutes, but uh, so try this one. Yeah. I know that he was he experienced uh, some censorship uh, at the New York Tribune, and um, mm-hmm. he was incredulous over over it. And and I just thought maybe <laughs> somehow we could talk about Matt Taibbi or Glenn Greenwald or Elon Musk or Parler or just you know um, what's happening. You know, just uh, right. you can give me reflections on that. I mean, Marx, you know, I mean, he was a journal. I mean, it would, I mean, the problem is, is that, you know, we don't have uh, too many writers whose ideas are dangerous. Um, <laughs> what we, right, what we have are, as it were, inconvenient or dangerous facts. Right, we live in a world in which there are lots of facts about the world that you know the the masses aren't supposed to know about. And so we have, in a sense, plain and crude censorship. Um, you know, like what the Twitter files are revealing. You know, the state just simply saying, you know, look, you can't, you know, we can't discuss uh, the origins and nature and you know course of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in public because the people can't handle it, right? It's basically as simple as that. Uh, you know, the government is going to decide what's true and how much to, you know, and what science consists of and the rest. And, you know, with, with Marx, it's not that he was, you know, revealing facts or, or whatever. He was just, <laughs> he was a leader of a rebel, you know, he wasn't a, <laughs> particularly prominent leader. There were many others, and he wasn't famous um, in the 1850s, but he was just one among the many revolutionaries who uh, had had threatened uh, the political order of Europe in 1848-49, 
And so they were banished from, I mean, so the most basic censorship that Marx faced was, uh, you know, the fact that he couldn't publish anywhere in Europe. Um, and that's why he comes to write for an American newspaper. Hmm. Um, you know, so I, I won't go into his struggles with the American, uh, with the Tribune's editorial board, you know, but um, we don't have time for that. But I would simply say that, you know, the kind of censorship that was faced then um, it was of a much higher level than what we're dealing with. And we're dealing with, like, basically, like, can Galileo conduct scientific, you know, can he conduct science scientifically without the church, you know, telling him what the truth is? Um, you know, it's as, it's as ele- you know, these, these questions are as elemental as that. You know, does the, does the public have the right to know about the corruption of its... Of, of, of politicians, the Hunter Laptop story is just a straight story of the political corruptions of a professional political family. We're going to have to um, leave it at that then. Yep. I'm sorry to cut you off. Mm-hmm. Fascinating stuff. No problem. We, yeah. Um, this is Living Art. I'm Michael Woodson, and our guest tonight has been uh, Spencer Leonard. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We'll uh, we'll do it again. I hope soon. Thank you so much.